Oh, shit. I couldn't find my, um, my library t-shirt. It's around here somewhere. It's, it, might, it might be in the laundry. I'm not sure. But anyways, um, welcome to the D. Louise book series. I'm Christina K-R-I-S-T-I-N-A. This is where we read books, talk about books. No special effects, no theme music, none of that extra special stuff going on here. Just reading book, talking books. And uh, as you know, I have three regular series. I'm thinking about starting a fourth. Um, what did I do with this over there? Um, Flashback Monday, Star Trek Fridays, and If Then Fridays. I'm also thinking about doing another one. And I'm trying to decide. I'm going to start this series. And I'm trying to decide um, if we should do it live, a few chapters every Saturday, or if I should do the whole book and then report back, like I usually do. But I'm really thinking <coughs> for the first book, that I might do it in pieces or a different way than I do the normal reviews because this one will set up the whole series. So we'll be talking about Beatrice Small Sky on Valley series. I'll look for those videos. <laughs> and maybe I'll put a poll out. People can help. Um, so anyways, I am extra sneezy today. I must have to get me a box of tissues. Oh. Um, so anyways, oh, there it is. we are talking about my favorite magazine in the whole wide world, Romantic Times Book Review. They do over 250 book reviews a month. And if you watch my podcast the other day, um, where I compared the magazine to Publishers Weekly to Mystery Scene to bookmark, to book page, um, it came to me that the, these people reviewed books that I would actually read. Um, Publishers does more of literature. Um, and if you saw that when I showed it, it was like 11 by 17 pages, but it was all one story. It just focused on one book. And I'm looking for you know, books that I read. 250 books that I read. Oh, I gotta sneeze again. I know what I caught. There. So anyways, where was I? I gotta sneeze it. Jesus. So, they actually review books that I will read. They talk about, um, Historicals, inspirationals, sci fi, mainstream fiction, teen books. Mystery books, contemporary romance, well, come here, co-host, come here, come on, come on, and my favorite section, paranormal. And we will also today, um, since I did a podcast on this the other day, please look for If Then, Harlequins. Look at all these Harlequins. Look at all those Harlequins. And also honorable mention, even though I've gotten rid of most of them. Um, but I will go into some of these uh, today. Erotica. And I've got to sneeze again. Uh, we're going to start out, they do so many, 
and we're going to be talking about some of these books. There's a whole story on Alison Brenneman, and I used to have her books, and I don't know what happened to them. They might have been given away in the gift, great giveaway. But she always does, um, she does series, and she usually does a three-book arch. And it says, um, Mom Author Gunslinger. Alison Brennan tackles more stories in a new genre. Alison Brennan and I are living parallel lives. We both reside in Sacramento, California area. We both have five children. We both lack academic scholarships to marry and start a family. We both work in politics before turning to writing for the same political party. And we both write romantic suspense. We even have the same literary agent. Oh, this was written by Brenda Novak. Um, and she wrote, uh, Alison Brenneman wrote three books that are coming out this, the 2009. This is the um, July 2009 issue, and her books are featured here. And uh, she did Sudden Death, Fatal Secrets, and Cutting Edge. I've got a sneak. And then Allison Brennan interviewed Brenda Novak. And Brenda Novak called me up one day last year and said, Allison, great news. I'm touring the morgue. Want to come? <laughs> and that's what they did. They went and toured the morgue. Oh, look, Michelle Obama. The recently marked, uh, pre the president recently marked his 100 day in office, but let's face it, what many of us really want to know is what Michelle Obama is wearing. The first lady of the United States has quickly become the first lady of fashion as evidenced by all the buzz and hype surrounding her clothing selections, be it for inaugural festivities back in January or her various international meetings, which is why we selected Michelle Style, celebrating the First Lady of Fiction by Mandy Norwood as our inaugural must-read nonfiction pick of the month. There you go. So, all right, so, uh, what did I do with these books? Oh, they're over here. All right, so, I've got this sneeze again. So, True Blood. We've got... Um, it's season two of the HBO hit inspired by Charlene Harris. Want a taste of true blood? Then get ready to take a bite out of this. The HBO phenomenon returns to the small screen in June, and according to executive producer Alan Ball, it's sexier and even more fun than this for the second time around. Based on Suki's, Charlene Harris's Suki Sack, Sackhouse series, True Blood is a Louisiana set TV show fraught with love triangles, passion, horror, social commentary, violence, and what else? Vampires and lots of them. With season two debuting just a month after the release of the ninth Suki Stackhouse Dead and Gone, fans can once again visit the fictional town of Bon Temps and its most compelling. Yeah. Excuse me going to be a sneezy podcast. So. Ah, 
we go. Dead and gone. Oh, was it? Was it, um, uh, MJ complaining about stickers on books the other day? Oh, I don't care. Oh, I gotta sneeze again. Didn't we read, didn't we read in the last issue of, um, Romantic Times that they, the publishers say that they have three seconds to capture your, um, attention with a, uh, book cover? Someone's gonna have to take a whole bunch of allergy medicine when she finishes this podcast. Um, so here we have our true blood. And I'm telling you, the books are better. Um, now, I ha- I still have yet to get, um, to find the paperbacks, because I want to get the paperbacks. When I first started, I got the anthologies, but they're not anthologies, but, um, this held, uh, Dead Until Dark and Living Dead in Dallas. And, uh... I don't like this Bill and Suki, but they're okay. Um, Dead Until Dark. Suki Stackhouse is a cocktail waitress in Bon Temps, Louisiana. You can tell she doesn't get out much, and it's not because she isn't pretty. She is. It's just that, well, Suki has a disability. She can read minds, and that doesn't make her too dateable. Then along comes Bill. He's tall, dark, handsome, and Suki can't hear a word he's thinking. Just the guy she's been waiting for all her life. Bill has a disability of his own. He's a vampire with seriously creepy crowd of friends. And we will do this series later this year. We will talk about them all. And, um, she, um, Suki and Bill married in real life. (laughs) Just to point that out. Um, so, I should have just meant this. In no particular order. Altogether dead. Definitely dead. We'll, we will do these podcasts in order later this year. Uh, dead and gone. Right, so it's dead until dark, living dead in Dallas. And... Uh, Dead to the World, uh, and Dead as a Doornail are these two. Um, dead in the Family. Oh, there's your sticker again. Oh, is this the one with Eric? Uh, yeah, she gets in bed with Eric. Woohoo! Alex Skarsgård was really cute. From Dead to Worse. Uh, Dead Reckoning. Now, um, Charlene Harris, like Kim Harrison, they both stopped their series at book 13. Um, however, Charlene moved on to Midnight, which we will talk about one day. Um, that was definitely, uh, it was a four book series, I think. Um, and it was on TV for a season or two. And the first book was a character introduction. And it was a very, very, very slow walk in the park. And it took took me almost a year to read that book. Because um, each character was like um, the main character. I forget her name off him. But she'd walk across the street and she'd meet her neighbor. And then the next day she'd walk next door and meet the neighbor. And then walk across the street and meet the neighbor and it just it was just like i probably read a hundred books in between um but kim harrison went back to rachel we will talk about her later this year and i'm very happy that kim harrison went back to rachel but sookie's dead black and um this was how she finished sookie and we hated it and dead ever after Okay, so. Is Alexander Skarsgård pictured here? 
No. Oh, there he is. Ah, oh, after he had his hair cut. He's no good with his hair long. Hair short. All right. Then there's also um, uh, article on Call of Negers. And Linda Castillo, we will do her book. Clubhouse. And Victoria Dalla. And Karen E. Olson, Anna J. Evans, Marjorie Liu. Um, we will talk about these so a couple of these authors too in our review because Ah, you wrote the book, the submission's finally in, now the work begins, starting the next book. Okay. All right, here we go. Now, look at all those historical romance books they reviewed. All of those books. That's probably more than the other magazines did all together. Okay. So. Uh, let's start. Pamela Montgomery. Uh, there we go. Four stars. The first in Montgomery's new paranormal series, Jewels of Kingdonia, is a compelling tale of magic, revenge, betrayal, and romance between a pirate, his lady, and the prophecy that haunts them both. Strong characters and lots of plot twists heighten the suspense and will keep readers spellbound. Brenna Cameron is touring modern-day Scotland looking for answers to her past. Transported by a sapphire pendant, she wakes up in 1687 aboard a pirate ship with a price on her head. Warwick Douglas, Viscount Lord Kinross, becomes entangled in her fate. He loses everything because of his wild cat and is forced to take shelter in the home he once rejected. Brenna is just as surprised as Warwick when he becomes her champion. She doesn't believe in magic or ancient prophecies. All she wants to do is get home. Rook promises to get her home, but the fate has other plans. Brenna gets only one chance, save herself or her pirate lover. The choice proves simple even as the world crashes around them. Mary Jo Putney. All right, I know I put it over here. Oh, here it is. Mary Jo Putney, loving a lost lord, four and a half stars. Uh, if you love the fallen angels, you'll adore lost lords. Men who form unbreakable bonds while at a school of four boys of good birth and bad behavior. Only the comparable Putney could bring to life and have your readers yearning to be close to such dynamic heroes and the woman who tamed them. Adam Darsh Sam Lawford, the Duke of Ashton, is a midfit, misfit, the son of a British nobleman and an Indian woman. He is 10 years old when he's thrust into the role of Duke. When one of his steamboats explodes, he's presumed dead, but his friends will not rest until they have proof of his demise. When her gambler father wins a North Cumberland estate, 
Mariah Clark has the home she longs for, but his sudden death makes her a target for the estate's former owner. She attempts to force, who attempts to force her into marriage. She invents an imaginary husband only to find a handsome man washed ashore with no memory. She names him Adam, and when he awakens in her bed, he's quite sure he'd love to remember being her husband. Their relationship blossoms, and when Adam is found, he realizes his love for Mariah is too powerful to be forgotten. But before they can find happiness, they must uncover who is trying to kill Adam. Patricia Rice, Mystic Warrior. Four and a half stars. Patricia Rice, Mystic Warrior. Um, with complex characters, Rice's last book in the Mystic Isle series pits a stubborn seasoned warrior against the equally determined young woman. Rice combines an overview of the French Revolution, depth of emotion, mysticism, and great love into one passionate and fiery story. I the she if you want to see her identity, uh, go to the New Year's Eve uh, videos and um, I had put new batteries in her last year, and she actually worked for like 48 hours. Prior to that, she was permanently set at 10 o'clock. I don't know why, but that's what she was set at. And when, after I ran the batteries, she was permanently set at 9.30. And it was bugging me because I was so used to seeing it set at 9.30. And, I mean, 10 o'clock. And I kept thinking, I'm going to go over here and but move the couch and, and get to her and fix her to 10 o'clock. I come down the other day. I'm not kidding. She was set at 10 o'clock for a decade. And then after I did the battery thing and she was at 9.30 for, oh, three, four months. I come down the other day. She's now set at 11. I don't know. She worked for an hour and a half. I don't know what's going on, if there's a ghost in the house. But all of a sudden, after four months of being at 930, she's now at 11. So who knows what's going on with her? Um, so, Lorraine Heath. Hello, Miss Lynn. Hello, Miss Lynn. How's my girl? You've been fighting today? You want to come to mommy? No, no, no. All right. Come here. 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 I don't. Come here. Lorraine Heath. You want to come here? No. I shouldn't have put all these books here. I can't see it. Uh. Ah, oh. uh, move closer. Uh, Lorraine Heath, four and a half stars, surrender to the devil. And Charles Dickens might be thrilled to see Heath bringing his Oliver Twist character back to life and give them closure and happily ever after stories. Um, readers have taken this ingenious and unforgettable series to heart, and with its conclusion, they will sigh with happiness, yet feel bereft to see such good friends, including Dickens himself, say goodbye. Along with Luke and Jack, Fanny Darling was lifted out of poverty and given a chance at a life, fine life but she's forever drawn back to the rookies. As Jack's bookkeeper, she's safe from the world of aptocracy she abhors, and he has, has the opportunity to rescue orphans. Then she meets Sterling Marbury, the eighth Earl of Greystone. She steals his heart as easily as she lifts his pocket watch, and the arrogant lord is determined to make her his. 
Darling has no idea that Franny desires him and the passion he represents. Yet as they fall in love, they are drawn into darkness of the London underworld. That alone means danger, but Sterling hides a secret that puts them even in more peril. All right. Oh. Ow! What'd you do that for? I forgot to mention these before. I dug them out. I forgot. Ow! What'd you scratch me for, Sandy? Sandy, what did you scratch Mommy? I don't know. Excuse me. I need a band-aid. Why are you mad at me? I left for 48 hours. Dang. So where was I? Oh, yes. Sabrina Jeffries. Wed him before you bed him. Uh, four and a half stars. Jeffries has written the ideal conclusion for her fabulous school for Aries series. Rewarding her fans by revealing a secret or two in the wondrous, tender, and sexual charge love and laughter story of Charlotte Harris, the school's founder with lively dialogue, deep emotion, and multifaceted characters. Jeffrey wins readers' hearts and holds fans' admiration. It's really David Lloyd Kirkwood who inspired Charlotte to found a school to teach girls to stay away from fortune hunters. Before her elopement with Captain Harris, Charlotte scandalized society by breaking off with David in a letter that shocked a ton. When the letter was accidentally published in a scandal sheet, it destroyed his reputation. Though David married one of Charlotte's former students after death, after her death, he sees a way to help Charlotte save her school. Charlotte has relied on the mysterious cousin Michael to see her through time, but now it seems she must trust David to help. Rebuilding a relationship that ended in unhappiness isn't going to be easy, but David is determined to rekindle the passion they had long ago and reawaken Charlotte's desires for her school as well for life and love. Kathy Maxwell. Four Dukes and the Devil and the Devil. Sorry, Kathy Maxwell, Elaine Fox, Janine Frost, Sophia Nash, and Tracy Tracy and Warm. So there was one, two, three, four of my authors. So, um, four stars. There is no recognizable theme that ties these five satisfying novellas together, but they're all well-crafted, quick, sensual, and emotionally engaging readers from five uniquely talented authors whose talents are full display. Maxwell's humor and wit sparkles in the Irish Duke as Miss Suzanne Rogers meets the man she's warned her protégés to avoid. More laughter ensues as Fox Duke, perhaps the most mischievous dog on Cape Cod, does his best to bring his owner love in the Duke who came to dinner. The devil in the title comes from Fox's gripping and dark paranormal, the devil to pay when a kind-hearted vampire attempts to save a demon-possessed human. Nash delights with a Duke, the catch of the century, who meets his match as an independent spirited school mistress. You'll be enchanted as much as Warren's rakish duke is by a young lady in distress and charmed by her smile. Okay. Charlie, I'm oh, sorry. Julia Quinn. And, oh. Loving Lost Lord had a full page ad in here too, by the way. Just thought I'd show that. Um, 
and so does, if I can find it, oh, it, I've got the book, so, um, Julia Quinn, What Happens in London, Four Stars. For humor, cleverness, and sassy dialogue, uh, there is nothing quite like a Julia Quinn novel. Her characters are of the time, yet still quite modern. And their stories are filled with passion, intrigue, and history. What's not to adore in this sequel to The Secret of Diary of Miss Miranda Cheevers? People wonder why Lady Olivia Be Bevel Stoke is on web. Could she be waiting for the Russian prince to propose? Actually, Olivia is intrigued by her new neighbor, Lord Harry Valentine, whom she's superstitiously been watching him through her window. Harry is aware of Olivia's scrutiny and captivated by her, not just because she's part of his latest assignment. He, the usually reclusive agent, attends society functions to spy on the prince, whom the Home Office suspects of treachery. Harry must keep a close eye on the possible French sympathizer, and that means keeping Olivia in sight as well. This proves to be a delight for them both. They begin conversing through their windows, discussing the latest gothic novel, meeting at balls and concerts in Ceres. But danger stalks Olivia, and Henry must keep a watchful eye on the woman with whom he's quickly falling in love. Oh, there it is. Gating Holy. The Marquise. My Wicked Marquise. It is freezing today. We went, we went from... 70 degree days to 50 to 30. It's like, what the F? It's spring! It's supposed to be warm! My Wicked Marquise, four and a half stars. From pirate ships to ballrooms, fully delivers strong plots, bold characters, and memorable romances with the first title in the Inferno Club she's created with her most powerful novel to date. Weaving threads of storylines and melding intrigue and suspense into a deep and passionate love story takes talent and daring, and Foley has an abundance of both. Max St. Albans, the Marquis of Rathstone, is hunting for a biddable wife, but finds himself attracted to Daphne Starling, who is anything but obedient. But she's the, only, the one woman who can bring love and laughter into his dark life. By falling in love with Max, Daphne gets caught in his dangerous world, the realm of Inferno Club, an ancient secret society trained to fight evil around the globe. Since Napoleon defeat, Max is prepared to marry and leave his mission behind. But when one of their faced foes kidnaps a member of the club, they are drawn into new dangers. As the love between Max and Daphne grows, Max will do whatever it takes to keep her safe and fulfill his mission. Shirley Busby. Four and a half stars. There we go. Busby, a grand mistress of the genre, hasn't lost her passion for building suspenseful romances or creating captivating characters. A sexual 
attention or enchanting plot. She keeps giving readers what they desire. Busby is a gift and each book a new brightly wrapped present. His father should have been the one who became Isabel Dunham's guardian, not young Marcus Sherber. The little hellion drove him insane, his disrupting his thoughts and threatening his reputation as a true gentleman. But when 17-year-old Isabel eloped with an officer headed for India, he was furious. Ten years later, widowed Isabel and her son returned to England, and she wrecks havoc on Marcus's life. Yet Marcus is intrigued by her, and when he discovers she's caught in a blackmail machine, he claims they are betrothed. Instead of preventing scandal, they start one. Now Isabel must marry Marcus or be branded a jilt. As passion develops, they get caught up in more than one treachery scheme. And not only is her black mirror a serious threat, but Marcus must find the means to save Isabel without betraying his country. Uh, and one last one here. Or is it the next? Oh, it's an inspirational. Okay, we're moving on to inspirational. If I can find it. Okay. Daisy Adams. Daisy Walker Adams. Um Oh Sticky Hawkins, sorry. Oh, I'm not there. There you go. <laughs> sorry. Um Adam's latest installment in the Jubilant Soul series is a replete with the realistic characters and intriguing dialogue. Unafraid to confront with sensitive issues, she provides readers with spiritual nuggets that can be applied to their lives. Those who haven't read the first installment may want to do so. Um, although it's the pace drags at times, the story has enough drama to keep readers wanting more. Indigo Burns has it all. She just finished college, has a great summer internship, and has been accepted into a master's program for photography. Coming back to Jubilant to celebrate her accomplishments is the icing on the cake, but Indigo's perfect world begins to shatter when she's diagnosed with glaucoma. She loses her internship, her favorite aunt suffers a stroke, and her man isn't the person she thought, thought she knew. Life becomes quickly complicated, and Indigo doesn't know which way to turn. With her life crumbling around her, she learns that God is the only one who can pick up the pieces. Okay. Hmm. Science fiction. No, it's here sometimes. <clears throat> Four Stars, gritty and realistic Nights series provides content, consistent high quality adventure. Book eight of the Vampire Earth series continues the story of the fight to free the world from alien captors. The character of Valentine evolves realistically in this, each story. Though scarred in battle one, he gains experience and knowledge along the way. Excellent battle scene strategy and descriptions take readers further along this epic journey. Aliens from Kerr have taken over the world, destroyed human society, and enslaved the survivors. Major David Valentine enlists with the Southern Command, one of the few remnants of the old U.S. government, and is determined to overthrow the current occupation and its minions of blood-drinking reapers, harpies, and gargars. His battalion in the Appalachians battling a raging blizzard, bands of headhunters and defecting allies. Worst of all, the currents decide to examine their region Exterminate the region rather than fight for conquest. Winter Judy. Uh, Witches Incorporated. E.E. E. Mills. Four stars. There we go. The second novel in Mills' Rogue Agent trilogy continues the tale of reluctant wizard Gerald and his engaging sidekick Red. A sassy talking bird. The plot moves swiftly, the dialogue is well done, and laced with humor. It's an entertaining novel with enough conflict and intrigue to keep the pages turning. Gerald Dunworthy believed he was only a third grade wizard until an adventure in New Ots land convinced him that he was first class and changed his life forever. 
Now he's in secret training for Artsland government and preparing for his first assignment. Mainstream fiction. The Penny Pinchers Club. Four stars. This warm and funny book is the perfect remedy for economic times. Stroh Meyer has a wonderful writing style that makes the reader feel included in the story, especially with the many humorous aids. Add in the appealing characters and the entertainment quotient goes up another notch as they have to figure out who or what is essential to their lives. Pat Griffin's favorite pastime is spending money, which has caused numerous arguments with her college professor husband Griff. As her daughter gets ready to leave for college, Kat discovers Griff has keeping secret bank account and spending a lot of time with sexy young research assistant. With no savings, Kat realizes it's time to take drastic measure if she's heading for a divorce. She joins the Penny Pincher Club and soon cancels cable television, stops going to Starbucks, and saves on the grocery bill by using food she's retrieved from grocery store dumpsters. The money might be accumulating, but it isn't making her relationship with her husband any clearer. Then Old Flame offers her a life where money once again would be no object. Kate must look into her heart and decide what she really wants. Uh, Grace Octavia. Uh, we'll do one of those. Uh, four stars. This wonderful book holds your attention from beginning to end. There are surprises at every turn, and no detail is left unexplained. Though there is subtle foreshadowing, it's still interesting to see how each character reacts. This book will inspire you to take charge of your own life. Journey lives the perfect life with a loving and supportive husband, a mini mansion, and a job she doesn't hate. But the return of a former student-turned-hip-hop artist opens Journey's eyes. She comes to grip with the tight reign her family has in her life and the many goals and dreams she has yet to achieve. Right. Romantic suspense. Let's do one of these. My favorite author's alter ego. You know me and J.D. Robbed. If you went through all those videos last year. Black Hills. As in previous novels, oh, and Nora always writes in trilogies. Eve Dallas is in 60 books. Nora writes in trilogies. They're always in trilogies. Um, as in previous Robert's novels, well-fleshed out characters add emotional punch to the action. Juxtaposition of animal and human predators eloquently points out where its true viciousness lies. Twin love stories are beautifully woven throughout the gripping suspense. This is one of Robert's best. Cooper Sullivan and Lily Chance met as children in the Black Hills of South Dakota, and Lily's young heart was broken when Coop returned to New York to make his mark. Their final days together were also hunted by discovery of a murdered young woman. Now, more than a decade later, Lily has opened her Chance Wildlife Refuge as sanctuary for big cats and other predators, needing a home. Coop has also returned to help his grandparents manage their ranch. Their reunion is anything but idyllic, and but when Lily and the refuge come under attack, Coop uses all his skills as former cop to keep her safe. A vicious killer is hunting and killing, all while making clear that Lily is his special target. Um, Colin Nagers, The Mist. Um, oh, there it is. The Mist. Ah, uh, four and a half stars. Readers can come to expect excellent from Negus, and she delivers it here. The pairing of a Trista Crack spy will but kicking her when Lizzie is inspired, and the multi-plot is extremely absorbing. The second-time British intelligence officer Will Davenport sees Hotel Lizzie rush. She's engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat with a knife-wielding man. The thug's been sent to kill the fiancé of Will's good friend, FBI agent Simon Cahill, and he gives up information about a bombing in Boston just in time to save the lives of other people near Simon. 
Uh, however, they can't prevent the kidnapping of FBI Director John March's daughter, Abigail Browning. Just who is Lizzie Rush and what's her game? Will intends to find out and to stop her for interfering in the cause any further. What Will doesn't know is that Lizzie is March's secret informant and she's been feeding him useful information about billionaire criminal Norman Estabrook for a long time. Hey, Brady. I don't know why. Oh. One scream away. Four stars. Brady weaves a tight and gripping mystery in One Scream Away. The romance builds slowly and releases in an emotionally satisfying conclusion which is both endearing and intense while traditionally romantic suspense novels have relied on the hero saving the day and the great for heroine falling into his arms. Brady's heroine isn't one to wait for a man to save her, not that she'd mind if he did. After an attack that changed her life, Beth Dennison creates a new life for herself and her daughter when her attacker Chevy Banks is released from prison. The only thing on his mind is tormenting Beth, as the body count rises, Beth must decide if she trusts FBI agent Neil Sheridan enough to come tell him face the truth or face handling Chevy on her own. <sighs> Stephanie Rowe. Ice. Three stars. Who knew things could get so hot in the frozen tundra of Alaska? Roe writes a non-stop action adventure complete with characters you'll grow to love. While the plot is well constructed, the character motiva motivations are unclear in the beginning chapters, and it's only as you get to know them that you understand the decisions they make. Kyle Fletcher spent her childhood resenting her family's love of danger climbing in the cold mountains of Alaska. Now her family is dead in a climbing accident, or are they? When a mysterious caller tells Kyle her mother is alive, she heads to the state she despises. However, the moment she sets foot in Alaska, the life is in danger, if not from the killer who seems to be obsessed with Kaylee's mother, and now Kaylee then from fearless flying of Cart McLean. Despite Kyle's strong attraction to court, she knows loving him will only end in heartache. She can't be with someone who lives on the edge of danger like her parents. Hmm. All right, let's move on here. Sworn to silence. Linda Castile, four and a half stars. Castile's hardcover debut should come with a warning. Pick up when you have time to finish. Excitement, danger, mystery, fascinating setting, and a conflicting heroine make this book make this a book you won't put down. The setting Ohio's Amish community is well drawn and the bind the mystery places the heroine in has no simple solution. The conflict couldn't be greater. Add a romantic hero with his own sharply drawn issues and the tension never lessens. When the tortured and murdered body of a young woman is found in tight-knit Amish town of Painter's Mill, Ohio, no one is more stunned and frightened then Police Chief Kate Burkholder. Sixteen years before, there was a similar series of murders, and Kate was 14 and living with her Amish family. But she left the church when she turned 18 and now feels like an outsider. Kate has to find the murderer while keeping a secret that could ruin her life forever and her career. Okay. Dean Kuntz. Exploring the line that separates the best and the worst of humanity is Kuhn's special specialty. But his mesmerizing tale, narrated by a prosecutor, readers can. Bing, 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 bing. And 
you know, what I've been saying, this magazine is as relevant today as it was back then. You can still go through this magazine and find books to read, find new authors to read. And these authors are still around too, like Dean Koontz. Um, four and a half stars. Successful novelist Cubby Greenwich is celebrating the release of his sixth novel with his equally successful children's author, wife, and their genius six-year-old son, when their lives run off the rails. It starts with an estervating review by much feared critic Sherman Wax, but escalates into a nightmarish terror. After an inadvertent meeting with Wax, Cubby and his family are suddenly under attack. They're not the first to be stalked in such a manner. The others were murdered in gruesome ways. Cubby and his family are now running for their lives from conspiracy that runs deep. Uh. Uh, Vicki Hines. Kill Zones. War Game Kill Zones. Part of Hines' War Game series previously released via Silhouette Bombshell, the story contains engrossing situations that racks up the suspense. Unique characters try to capture an evil to the core villain before he strikes again. Hines ends this outing with a perfect setup for the next adventure. Psychologist Morgan Cabot is part of an elite secret military group called the Special Agent Special Abilities Team. She and her combat trained colleagues can see, hear, and feel things that others cannot. The Secretary of Defense calls on the team to track down and capture Thomas Kuntz a sadistic terrorist who specializes in black market arms sales and intelligence brokering. Kuhn's latest target seems to be Bruce Stern, a biological warfare expert. Stern's wife has been murdered so the military can bring in his brother Jackson to work with the team to determine if Bruce murdered his wife or if the work of Kuhn's, what they find is more chilling than they imagine. Okay, um, James Rollins, four stars. Rollins writes with such detail that these events seem not only possible, but probable. The story quickly shifts from one event to another with settings and characters that are well-researched and believable. Rollins takes his time in revealing the connections between these puzzling events. But readers who like intriguing characters and non-stop action will enjoy this novel. I was cold. Um, when the world food supply is threatened by a corrupt industrial signal force agent, Gray Pierce must find out who is behind this crime and stop them. But the bad guys are always half a step ahead of Sigma Force agents and their allies. Cryptic clues lead Pierce and his colleagues on a high-stakes mission to save the world that requires great personal sacrifice. Okay. And if you watched my last year's podcast, you know we did all of Janet. Four stars. The 15th chapter of Janet's long-running Stephanie Plum series will keep... Re keep the wacky, hilarious high. Only Ivanovich can make the shenanigans of the snutty crew seem almost reasonable. With Stephanie taking a hiatus from men, the tale spotlights the girls' club. There are giggles galore. For once, Stephanie is an innocent bystander rather than a troubled magnet. After Luella witnesses the decapitation of a barbecue chef and the deadly but somewhat incompetent killers are on her tail. To claim the million-dollar reward catching the killer, Lula and Grandma Mizura decide to enter the barbecue cook-off competition, dragging a reluctant Stephanie along. Ranger is also having problems. Someone is bypassing his electronic systems and burglarizing his clients. 
Roger hired Ranger hires Stephanie to see if it's an inside job. And Stephanie does a really good job. And you will have to watch my podcast for a more in-depth uh, showing of that. Oh, my nose again. Okay, I think that's it for... Oh, um, I'm starting co to collect this this series. Um, I don't have this one yet. Um, to do as podcasts. I've got a couple over there, but I don't have this one. So, and I love the Molly series, Rice Bones, um, Royal Flush. The Bowen pulls the readers into a convincing 1930 Britain filled with actual historical figures and intriguing fictional characters. The novel starts a bit slowly, but picks up as the story continues. At times, the heroine's monologues are a bit too chatty, and the author's own voice seems to speak through her main character. When Lady Georgiana and her wild friend Belinda find themselves in the midst of a social scandal, Georgia is shipped off to her family country manor. There, the queen assigns her to keep an eye on fellow house guests Wallace Simpson and Prince Wallace. Scotland Yard also enlists her help to prevent someone from shooting the Prince of Wales. Did we do? No, we didn't do this one. So David Morrell, and I have Morrell ancestors, by the way. Um, four and a half stars. This fast, bl fast moving blend of the mysterious, the historical, and paranormal is smart and fascinating. The characters are well drawn and psychologically interesting as the tension escalates and the secret to a long time mystery is revealed. When police officer Dan Page comes home to find his wife, Corey inexplicably missing, that he follows her trail to rest of a small, isolated Texas town. Tori is drawn to the place where, as a child, she saw strange lights dancing in the sky. The lights bring her peace and happiness she's been missing. And not only her, hundreds of people, for some reason, it's a miracle. For others, a source of frustration or anger. When violence erupts, Dan and Ter Tori investigate. Also in the area is military, the site run by a commander who knows some of the history of the lights and their powers. about that um contemporary romance we'll do one um man of fortune the blue one uh, four stars. The second of the best men series could be named. Where can I get one of those? Woo! Duncan Gilmore is next up in the queue, and he's just as tasty as the first gentleman in this trio. The author easily captures the electric elements that bring these strong personalities together. Duncan is trapped in an elevator with Damara Walcott. He takes an instant interest. This is a welcome change because Duncan has been in mourning since his fiance was killed on 9-11. She wasn't completely resolved his feelings about his loss. He definitely loved her, but if it's romantic love or guilt, Duncan was trying to save her from her sheltered life, but that was enough to base the future on. For once part, Tamara's broken marriage was no less traumatic, and she's not anxious to become intimately involved in another one. that um damn good man michelle l wit violet who knows let me know there you go naked guy on the cover has got to be a good book right you know that they said that um booksellers do try to do their covers they have three seconds to capture attention as you walk through a bookstore
Woman meets man, woman and man date, woman and man have so much baggage they part. Single mom and real estate agent Gwen Macaroni is on the hunt for thir husband number three. Gwen likes being married, but she has a history of choosing the wrong man. She thinks her luck may be changing, however, when Joel Hubbard walks into her office. Joel is a widower and single dad who thought he was happy with his life until he met Gwen and realizes what he was missing. Victoria Dell. Where is it? Oh. Start me up. There you go. Um, four stars. With heroin longing to break free and a hero willing to help her. Dallas spun a scorching tale about what can happen in the blink of an eye and what we can do to change our lives. It's definitely a story that today's readers can relate to, thanks to a small-town setting that's become more vivid with each book and great secondary characters. Lori Love had to sacrifice her dreams of international travel to take charge of her father's garage. Her best friend's return to Tumble Creek catalyzes Lori's desire to break free in the only way her circumstances will allow. No strings fling, no strings fling with her childhood crush, her best friend's brother, Quinn. Hmm. This is not good to mess with your best friend's boyfriend. Best friend's brother. Um. All right. Let's move on here to my favorite subject in the world. Paranormal. First up, Christine Feehan. Four and a half stars. For the culmination of her Drake sister series, Feehan delivers a wrenching and turbulent story that explores the aftermath of torture. With protagonists who have suffered a psychotic villain bent on destruction, you have the makings of a blowout finale. An undercover, undercover operation goes horribly wrong, and the seventh Drake sister, Ellie, is taken prisoner by Stavros Grastos a melogrammatic psychic who has found a way to electronically block psychic powers. Sea Haven Deputy Sheriff Jackson Joe stops at nothing to rescue Ellie, with whom he is telepathically linked. It takes the combined efforts of all the sisters to save Ellie, but that's not the end, since their sister will never be the same. Jacqueline Frank, four and a half stars. Treachery from within threatens the shadow dwellers in chapter two of this new series. The steamy passion Frank is known for takes on an educational edge as the abused heroine discovers her powers. The sexy spicy punctuated with deadly danger, making this one hot read. Having horribly betrayed his previous handmaiden, warrior priest Magnus is somewhat reluctant to take on someone new. But a promise made in Dreamscape must be honored as he brings abused slave Denara to sanctuary. While Day's life has not prepared her for the opulence of her new world, it has prepared her for the treachery beneath the surface. She has a warrior's heart and does not back down even when butting heads with the legendary Magnus. Um, oh, where did I just see that? Just see that. Oh, this way. Okay. There you go. Dust to dust. Four and a half stars. Now, you tell me, is this magazine worth it? to read today as it was back then. Heather Graham still exists today. These books still exist today. You can still find these books. If you had a Time magazine, could you go get the stuff in there? No. But this book, these books are still there. They're still on your shelves today. They're still good reads. Graham's skill as Victoria Stella has never been more apparent. Combining action with richly detailed characters, she sets the stage for a four-book series that promises to be epic. On a visit to L.A., graphic artist Scott Bryan spends an evening partying with two friends. Afterward, en route to their hotel, the three men become to the rescue of an elderly couple being mugged. Bent over the old man, Scott gets a shock and suddenly has incredible strength. 
That night, the dreams begin a fearsome wasteland inhabited by the dead. The visions are shared by a dog trainer, Melanie Reagan, who's not an artist, but is somehow able to draw disasters in incredible detail just before they occur. The two men, the two meet under extraordinary circumstances and then go to Rome in search of the mysterious oracle. Alanis Day unmasked here. I, she is a local author for me, and I had these books, but I realistically are not, or you can, I know people who really like these books, and they have a lot in common with Gina Showalter's books, but I couldn't get past the vampire underwater bit. It just didn't work for me. I just couldn't get past all the water. It, it just, it was too much. I, Showalter, I have them, eh. But uh, Alyssa Day and Showalter, if you like Alyssa Day, you're going to like Showalter. If you like Showalter, you're going to like Alyssa Day. They have a lot, lot, a lot, 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 lot in common. Uh, four and a half stars. Hot Talent Day follows up last month's Warrior of Poseidon adventure with a story focusing on the exploits emotionally and physically scarred Alexia. As each novel unfolds, more details about the path to rising Atlantis are revealed. Alexio survived his two years of torture at the hands of vampire goddess Anuba, but just barely. Scarred inside and out, he has no intention of becoming emotionally attached, but a human warrior spikes that plan. Grace Haviland, a descendant of the goddess Diana, is unmatched with a bow. Grace and Alexios are tasked with training new human recruits and tracking down legendary gem, the vampire's bane with a high price of Seely Court appears and wants to parlay. Everyone is on edge. If the Fae are no longer willing to stay on the sidelines, the danger must be growing. Um, I think I did. Cynthia Eden, Midnight's Master. This heart, the he four stars. The heat that Holly and Nile generate warms the chill from a truly gruesome organ-stealing murder. Readers will cheer at their unlikely character attraction, but the twist in the plot is what really makes Eden's latest unforgettable. Reporter Holly is afraid to get their hands dirty to help catch the killer murdering her city's other population. Niall, a bar owner and the most powerful demon, knows that if someone is demon hunting, it's going to take demonic strength to end the killing spree. He doesn't want any human, no matter how hot she is, getting in the crossfires. Um... I have a whole bunch of her books, but I don't have this one, and I, I don't. Um, Sucker for Love, Kimberly Ray, and I know. I could have not written that down. Only me. Oh, there was. The Cynthia Eden book right there in the middle. Midnight. But I knew... Every time I turned around, I saw this book. Oh, here it is. Sucker for love, down here in the corner. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> now I've lost my place. This is another fun, fast-moving story about Vampire Lil and her matchmaking business. Ray's gifted writing makes the heroine overbearing relation relatives wonderfully entertaining. It's too bad Lil's man squeeze makes such a limited appearance. At a dead-end dating meeting and greeting, one of born vampire Lillian Marchand's vampire clients disappears. Lil discovers that Esther is going to be used as a sacrifice by Madrid Lucas, a powerful warlock to gain youth and immortality. Warned not to interfere, Lil sets out to do just that. <laughs> Patty O'Shea, Edge of Dawn. There we go. Oh, four, three stars. O'Shea's interesting world is filled with fun characters, though it starts off 
a bit rocky. The novel soon picks up throwing in one mystery after another and leaving some open-ended so you're sure to pick up the next book. Artist Shana Blackwood is more than she seems. When troubleshooter Logan Andrews is assigned to be her guard, he must wedge his soon way through Shanna's defenses. Logan is soon falling for the girl who was only meant to be an assignment. Once Logan and the rest of the genial become aware of exactly why Shona is being hunted, they realize she might be more important than they originally thought. Ugh. Desire Untamed, Pamela Palmer. Three stars. Palmer drops readers immediately into a new world, right along with heroin Kara. Though parts of the novel can be a bit tedious, readers will be flipping the pages to learn the outcome of the various mysteries that are sparkled throughout. Normal, everyday Kara McAllister is thrown into a completely new life just hours after her mother's death. Lion, one of the group called the Feral Warriors, announces that Kara is not only one of them, she's also a source of all their powers. The Radiant. Kara has a short time to get used to her new job, her new immortality, and the fact that she must secure love of one of the men in the house. Okay. Um. I did this one. I did a if then for dragons. So please check out the if then for the dragons. Um. I had this book and I can't find it, so we'll do the picture. Um, it's dragons prefer blondes. It's time for the Carruthers sisters to kick more supernatural butt and make sure they look damn fine doing it. The first person viewpoint turns this time to Alexis' perspective. Humor and Snoopy dialogue are always major contemporary components of Haven's novels. Between running her worldwide group of nightclubs and killing dragons who attack humans, Alexa has no time for a romantic relationship. That turns out to be a problem when Dragon Warrior Jin Jin informs her he has decided to make her his mate. Interesting. Um. <clears throat> Huntress. Christine Warren, Marjorie M. Liu, Caitlin Kittredge, and Jenna McLean. Four stars. This quartet of authors delves deep into a variety of dark worlds where Survival is anything but assured. Two of the stories build on characters introduced in other books, while the other two are standalones. First up is Warren's Devil's Bargain, where supernatural bounty hunter Lil Corbin must match wits with the devil as she struggles to save her soul and the life of sexy mage Aaron Bullitt. Lil offers readers The Robber Bride, a post-Olympic tale that features a young woman named Maggie as she struggles to survive against the arrival of dangerous bands of beings who free, feed on life forces. In Down in the Ground Where the Dead Men Go, Kittredge explores the further adventures of Maze Jack Wyndham as he attempts to aid a sexy demon slayer in her quest. Finally, in Sin Slayer, McLean provides another episode in The Sin Craving, this time, Sin is battling to save her husband, Michael, from a demon. And uh, I didn't, I was quite surprised that I didn't own this one. Um, I don't know why I don't own this one, because I have them all over there, and we will do them eventually. Um, Kim Harrison... But it only got three stars, and it's not a Rachel, so maybe that's why it wasn't a Rachel. Maybe that's why I didn't pick it up. Um, and I'll try and do one of these. I might not. We'll see what happens. Um, this is getting to be a really long podcast. Um, once dead, twice shy, three stars. Although the beginning is awkward and parts of the novel are hard to follow, this is a great young adult debut for Harrison. Madison died on prom night, and right now she's hiding from the guy who killed her. Not quite alive, but not completely dead. She's trying to be a normal teenager. But when her guardians disappear and leave her in a mess of trouble, she must rely on Josh, whom she barely knows, and begin begin a guardian angel as they struggle to evade the dark reapers who will kill her for good. All right, now. Oh, wait a minute. How did I miss these? They got three books over here. All right. 
four and a half stars. Seduce the Darkness, Gina Showalter, four stars. Gina Sh Showalter is a master of creating dark and enchanting paranormal worlds. In her latest, she masterfully combines aliens, vampires, and humans in a compelling and entertaining story of lust, deception, intrigue, and love, of course. Devin D. Bond, Lucy Prince of Tanagra Royal House, lives a deprived and lustful life as an heir agent. He's free to live as he sees fit even if that means having sex with various alien species, humans and vampires. But Brian McHale's energy and disinterest intrigue him. Devin draws her into his life only to become smitten with her. Ah! I must have a book in my chocolate. Oh, and I pulled this one. I'll have to look for it later again. Roll that. Four stars. Here we go. Mark of the Demon, Roland. Diana Roland. Utilizing her real world experience as an ex cop forensic assistant, debut author Roland pulls together an edgy new urban fantasy that boasts a police procedural and a demonic thriller. The collision of her and Kara's dual careers sets the stage for an engrossing, gritty novel that also possesses a dangerous, sexy edge. A Los Angeles police detective by day, Kara, a knight, practices her inherited skills as a demon summoner. But a routine summoning goes in inexplicably wrong, and instead of a low-level demon, the angelic-looking but horribly dangerous demon lord, Rezico Pierce, and Kara is handed a new, possible new symbol man serial murder case. As the crime scene, she faces of magic and the arrival of sexy FBI agent Ryan Kristoff also complicates matters. Okay. Now. We're going to do a couple of uh, Harlequins. If I can find my page here. Um... Oh, I thought I set it up. Um, okay. I made a list. I can't find the list, so I'm embarrassed. But anyway, so please stick with me for these. Um, uh, the cami. I know I wrote these down. I remember writing it down. Um. So. Brenda Jackson. Intimate Seduction. Four stars. Uh, when Princeton professor Natalie Ford comes home to assist her injured aunt with her cleaning business, she makes the mistake of falling asleep in a client's bed. That's where Playboy businessman Donovan Steele finds her when he gets home. It's been Natalie's experience that men are turned off by her smarts, so she doesn't tell Donovan her true vocation as she tries hard to keep her their relationship professional. As this very entertaining story unfolds, Donovan and Natalie fall for one another and are happy until Donovan thinks Natalie is trying to sabotage his business venture. Jackson once again delivers wonderful character and a terrific dynamic dialogue, and it's a pleasure to visit with the Steele family again. Um, inherited one child, Day Lee Claire. Right there. 
Um, millionaire Jack Mason is at his wit's end. He's just learned that unless he finds a wife, he's going to lose custody of his five-year-old adopted niece. Desperate, he advises for a nanny, then advertises for a nanny. Then figures he can negotiate the right candidate into a marriage of convenience. Annalise Stefano seems to have a knack for dealing with a difficult girl. Enchanted, Jack hires her and during a seaside vacation marries her on the beach. As the three struggle to become a family, Alyssa worries what will happen when her own dark secret comes out. Um, Marie for Ella. The three... The 39-year-old version. There. Time for the glare. Uh, having left the church to care for her ailing mother, ex-nun Clara Santello is trying to adjust to her new life when she runs into police officer Caleb McCain. As a teenager, Claire babysat Caleb and he had a crush on her. Now a widower and a father, he still wants Claire and she can't resist him despite her misgivings about their age difference and doubts about her decision to leave the order. Hmm. Second chance family, Margaret Daly. Uh. Where is this? Billionaires. Is bright, one star. Oh, there it is. Hit the bottom. All right. Second chance family up there. Uh, widow Dr. Shane McCoy meets Whitney Maxwell when his autistic son Jason runs in front of her car, causing a minor accident. An assistant teacher at the elementary school, Shane wants Jason to attend. Whitney reluctantly becomes involved with them reluctantly because her future plans leave no room for a, a rather controlling, strong Christian man for whom she doesn't feel good enough. But circumstances soon have Whitney becoming an important part of both Shane and Jason's lives. Um, okay, let's move on here. Emma Holly. She also got a full page. Here we go. Where is it? Right, four stars. I am really lacking today. I apologize severely. If you're still here, it's a miracle you're still here. I, I thank you greatly for being sticking this out with me for over an hour. Um, a Emma Holly, Breaking Mid Midnight. From the opening chapter, Holly provides enough suspense and mystery to keep readers in thaw, and she turns up the heat with her sensual sex scenes. Edmund Fitzclair, an elder upright, wakes in a dungeon shackled and helpless in 1933. He's been kidnapped by a rival faction of his own kind, immortal shapeshifters who intend to use him as a pawn to control the world. His mortal lover Estelle sees him in his dreams, but her visions put her and her fam his family in increasing danger as she gets closer to finding him. Oh. And, uh, I think I'll call it a day. Um, that was me there. So please hit the like and subscribe. And, you know, I'm telling the truth here. This magazine is still good and valid today. You can still find good books to read today from this magazine. And I hope you found a few from my uh, in, in, in introducing you to these books. Um, and just go... 
we did this sapphire dream. Well, I didn't get to this one, but Deborah Webb. Um, we did the Huntress. There's some more books. Alison Brennan. Brenda Novak. Joan Johnston. Here we'll go like that. Better. Outcast. Dave Morrell. Some hot romances. We've done these, we'll do them again. The Frank books. Some romance. A thriller. I used to have this at a Laurent Shannon McKenna. We talked about Julia Quinn. And uh, for those of you who are into adult situations, we got some adult stuff for you. No other magazine covered this broad range of materials on your best. I don't know, I can't find these, it's driving me crazy. Uh, some heat. Some more romance. Miss these book conventions. They were fun. God, did you spend money at these things? And Heather Graham. There you go, cover to cover of Romantic Times book review. Please hit the like and subscribe. Thank you.